Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us at Defeat Duchenne Canada in one of our annual in our series of webinars with industry partners. Today, we'll hear some breaking news on the latest research on PNG EDO 51. The X151 skipping therapy from PepGen and details about the Connect 1 EDO 51 Canadian clinical trial ongoing. Um, so we could have had better timing to schedule this particular webinar as the news was released just this morning. My name is Perry Esper and I'm the CEO of Defeat Duchenne Canada. And before we get started, we'd like to jump into a few housekeeping items just to uh, make sure we've covered a few things on the technical side. Um, first, please ensure, or please use the chat feature to post comments and questions. Our speakers will aim to answer those toward the end of the session. Speaking of the end of the session, we should have plenty of time for discussion where you can raise your hand to unmute or turn your camera on for in-person conversation with today's speakers. Uh, we want to be sure to uh, clearly uh, able to, to hear today's session. So if you'd like to test your audio now, you can do that by going to the bottom left-hand side of your screen, or you can click the audio button and adjust the volume level. Now, for those of you who might be new to Defeat Duchenne Canada and who we are as an organization, founded in 1995 by John and Jesse Davidson, and known worldwide as Jesse's Journey, it survived that way. Last year, 14 months ago, when we rebranded the organization to Defeat Duchenne Canada. Certainly a new name, but the same mission and vision, a future without Duchenne. Through our mission, we are focused on education and support for families living with Duchenne and Becker across Canada, advocating for access to treatments here in Canada, and by funding research, which as of today, tops $16 million on projects worldwide. As mentioned earlier, today's webinar is one in a series of our educational activities across the year to help educate and inform Duchenne and Becker families about activity here in Canada. None of this work would be possible without the support of some of the corporate partners you see listed here as 2023 educational partners. Thanks to PTC as our platinum sponsor, Edgewise is a gold sponsor, and to our silver sponsors, Regenix Bio, Detail Pharmaco, PepGen, Pfizer, Avidity Biosciences, and Roche. Now it's time to introduce today's session, and we're thrilled to welcome PepGen to provide you an update on its work here in Canada on its Exxon 51 skipping therapy and the Connect ED, sorry, the Connect 1 EDO 51 clinical trial. Presenting today on behalf of PepGen is Jane Larkindale, Vice President of Clinical Science, who has worked the last 15 years accelerating therapy development for rare diseases with a focus on neuromuscular disease. Jane is a molecular biologist by training and having completed her PhD in the Department of Plant Sciences at Oxford University, which she attended on a Rhodes Scholarship. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jane and the PetGen team. Jane? Hi, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I will be share, sharing this uh, presentation with my colleagues. So I'm just going to get our slides up, um, up there and then we'll get started. But huge thank you to, um, to, um, to Defeat Duchenne for inviting us to speak today. Um, we're really excited. Today is a really exciting day for us. So with no further ado, I'll be back to talk to you, talk to you in a moment, I'm gonna, but I'm going to hand over to our Senior Vice President of Clinical Development, Michelle Mellion. Michelle. Thank you, Jane. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, I think that these are our disclaimers. I'm not going to read this to everybody uh, in detail, but um, if we uh, provide these slides to you later, you can all memorize it later. But um, next slide, please. Uh, these are, this is our agenda today. Um, I will be giving you our introduction um, and talking about PepGen and our technology. And some of you may already know about our news, which we're very excited. I'll discuss that in just a moment. Um, and then um, my colleagues, uh, Ashling Holland and Jane Larkindale will then uh, speak about why we think uh, EDO51 may make a difference in people with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And then um, uh, Jane will be joined by Sarah, uh, Vaca and talking about um, our exciting uh, Connect One uh, study, um, uh, which is a phase two study, as well as providing you some information about our program uh, to treat people living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And then, of course, we'll be happy to answer questions um, from people on the line. Next slide, please. 
So for those of you um, that are not familiar, uh, PepGen is a clinical stage biotechnology company, um, and we are advancing the next generation of oligonucleotide therapies with the goal of transforming the treatment of severe neuromuscular and neurological diseases. And um, uh, for those of you that are unaware, today we announced um, that we have received our no objection letter uh, for our clinical trial, uh, for our clinical trial application from Health Canada uh, to begin our phase two connect one EDO fifty one study, uh, which is an open label multiple ascending dose study in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy amenable to exon uh, fifty one skipping, and you will hear more about this uh, later in the presentation. So as I was saying, PepGen, um, we are located in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, we are about 50 plus employees, and um, we're all very dedicated uh, to advancing therapies that are transformational for people living with rare diseases, such as uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But we also have other uh, diseases that we are evaluating for our technology, uh, and that is also myotonic dystrophy. Uh, but today we will be focusing on uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Next slide, please. Um, as I was saying, um, today we'll be focusing on uh, our program uh, for exon skipping, uh, and we refer to our molecules as EDO51 or EDODM1, depending on um, what disease we're in, as well as which exons that we are skipping. As you can see from our pipeline here, um, the most advanced program is in um, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy for those amenable for exon 51 skipping, closely followed on by a program uh, for myotonic dystrophy. And then we are evaluating other exon skippers, including 53, 45, and 44. And lower down in the pipeline, we also have additional neuromuscular indications, as well as neurological indications that we are evaluating for our uh, technology. Next slide. And so today we'll be uh, introducing you to not only our technology, um, but our team. Um, as Jane said, I'm the SVP and head of clinical development. I'm also a neurologist with subspecialty training in neuromuscular disease, and I've been in the clinic for about 20 years. Um, and so I will hand it back to Jane uh, to get into what everybody wants to hear about, which is our uh, technology and why we think our technology uh, can be helpful for people living with rare diseases. Jane? Thank you, Michelle. And I'm actually going to pass almost directly on to Ashling, who has really been the driver of this technology since before PepGen was a company. So she is going to take you through, take you through a lot of the, the data and why we think this is so important for us. But before we move on, just wanted to briefly um, point out what's on the slide, which is that the Duchenne community is at the center of everything we do. We and the company have lots of different functions, lots of different areas we're working in. But um, it's really important to us that everything we do is informed by you and we're doing it for you as the eventual people who would want to use any therapy that we develop. The other thing I wanted to point out is on the far right of the slide, you can see my colleague Elena Tress, who's our head of patient advocacy. She's currently out of office on maternity leave, but we'll be back next month. And I hope many of you will have the opportunity to meet Elena, talk to her, work with her, ask her questions once she's back. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Ashley to talk about our preclinical data. Ashley. Perfect. Please. Thanks, Jane. Oh, actually, I, I'm sorry. I forgot there was a, a few more slides. Sorry about that, Ashley. Um, exon, exon skipping. I think most of you probably know what exon skipping is. It's been around in the Duchenne community for a long time. But just for those of you who um, who, who maybe it may be newer to the area, a refresh is always useful. So for those of you who don't know, the genetic code is written in these trios of three bases. So when, you, when you're reading a gene, it's read in blocks of three, which is fine most of the time. But unfortunately, if you have a mutation, and in Duchenne, this can be a big mutation or a small mutation. Here, I've illustrated a small mutation that just took out the B-I and big. So if the sentence initially read, the mad cat ate the big rat and the fat bat, after that mutation is in there, it reads, the mad cat ate the gratin, bleh, 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 bleh. and needless to say, the cell can't translate that. And, they, and people with that mutation end up with neurodystrophin. What exon skipping technology does is skips over a little bit additional in the, in, in the gene so that you end up with a, sens um, a sensible um, sentence. In this case, the mad cat ate the fat bat. Now you've lost some information. We no longer know anything about the big rat, but this makes sense 
the information is passed forward. And in the case of dystrophin, this creates a dystrophin protein that can be read by the cell, can be produced, and do all the functions that dystrophin is supposed to do. So this is the underlying concept of exon skipping. It's been around for a while. I think many of you know that there are exon skipping drugs that have been approved in the US, not in Canada, unfortunately, at this point. But the problem with existing oligonucleotides is that they don't get into the cell very well. So if your drug doesn't get to the place it needs to be to work, you don't get as much effect as you'd like. So if you think about it as like being on the Zoom call and you have the most important information to bring to this webinar, but you can't get in, you're unable to connect. So that piece of information never gets to those of us on the call. We never know about it. And we continue to do what we've been doing all, um, all along, which in the case of, our, of cells of people with Duchenne is producing not very much or no dystrophin. The EDO solution, adding our EDO peptides to that oligonucleotide allows it to get into that Zoom room, provide that new information, skip over the, um, a section of the DNA and produce dystrophin. So that's really the step change of our EDO technology is allowing those oligonucleotide drugs, those exon skipping drugs that we know are, could be effective, get to where they need to be to be effective. And I think Ashling is going to, going to show you a lot more of the actual data to support that. But this technology can work for a whole lot of different, different subpopulations in Yushan. We're talking mostly about EDO51 for exon 51 skipp skippable people. But as Michelle noted, we have programs in 53, 45, and 44, which are moving along fast. There's another 36% of people with Duchenne who could be affected by other exon skips. But unfortunately, this isn't going to be amenable for everybody. So we're going to talk to you today about EDO51. But remember, if you don't have a 51 skippable mutation, what we learn from EDO51 will be applied to these future exons and will allow us to develop these much more quickly in the future, assuming success. And with that, this time I really am going to pass it over to Ashley, having remembered that there's an intermediate section. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks, Jane. Hi, everybody. My name is Ashley Holland, and I'm the Director of Preclinical Development at PepGen. So as uh, Jane and Michelle have already suggested, we are committed to the development of transformative therapies for the DMD community. And we're going to be focusing today on our most advanced program for EDO51 or for our Exxon 51 skipping individuals. So just taking it back a few steps and kind of putting it into a slightly different format as to how Jane explained it from the, the sentence side of things. So how does PGN EDO51 work? So in normal individuals, the pre-mRNA um, is transcribed into mature mRNA that produces the critically important protein called dystrophin. However, in individuals with DMD, uh, they have uh, different mutations that can cause out of frame mutations. That means that we cannot produce any dystrophin protein. So as Jane says, this is when part of the, the letters of the sentence have been removed. However, with our PGN EDO51 compound, we're able to restore that reading frame and remake a sentence that can make sense then. So with our PGN EDO51, we can then produce a shortened truncated version of the dystrophin protein. And over the last number of years, we've been working on all of our EDO51 program from a variety of different aspects. So most recently, we've actually been in the clinic for a phase one trial, and we were able to show the highest levels of exon skipping and oligonucleotide delivery in humans. Um, and this was after a single dose, and this was generally well tolerated. But I won't go into that in too much detail, because I know my colleagues are going to be talking about that in more detail in a few minutes. However, before we can get into humans, we actually have to do a variety of different testing to look and see how well our compounds work. And we do this through a variety of different ways, both in vitro, but also in mouse models and in non-human primates as well. And I'll go through some of the data in a few minutes, but um, ultimately we've been able to show in non-human primates that we've got very high levels of exon skipping at tolerable target dose levels. And this is compared to any other of the approved XM51 therapies or development candidates as well. And again, when we take it into mouse models and ones that are very specific that to replicate parts of the, the physiology and the, the kind of more anatomical side of what we see for Duchenne, we're able to see that we've got high levels of dystrophin expression and also exon skipping following a single and after a repeat dose in the MDX mouse. So on the next slide, I can give you a little bit of an intro into some of the data that we've been able to generate so far. 
So we originally started out on looking in wild type mice and looking after a single dose at low doses of 10 mg per kg and looking at what the exon skipping levels can look like. So as Jane said in one of the earlier slides, we have the uh, original exon skippers or ASOs that are not conjugated to a cell penetrating peptide and they have challenges into delivering into the muscle and having activity. And when we look at this graph here, we've got the PMO EDO23, and that's what that is there. And we were able to see that even after a single dose, there was no exon skipping. However, with our EDO23 compound in green, we can see that we've got 51.7% exon skipping after a single dose. We can compare that as well to other exon skippers that are using P uh, uh, cell penetrating peptides that are conjugated to these, for example, with this R6G peptide conjugated to the PMO. And we can see even with that peptide, we're having very low levels of exon skipping. So this data was very supportive of us using our EDO technology to enhance the delivery over both unconjugated and earlier conjugated um, PMOs as well. But looking at exon skipping is important. However, really looking at the dystrophin side is even more pivotal for the development of this technology. And that's one of the limitations for the wild type mouse is that you can't look at dystrophin. So instead, we use the MDX mouse model. And this is one of the most robust and established models for the DMD field for the preclinical evaluation. So for this, we looked at a single administration into the MDX mice, looking at two different dose levels of 30 and 60 mg per kg. And we wanted to see not just at one time point of what the exon skipping or dystrophin levels look like, but actually tracking that over time to help support our program and provide better insight into how long this activity lasts for. So if we look at the exon skipping in the biceps muscle after a single dose, we can see that we've got sustained high levels of exon skipping up to four weeks post dose. But importantly, this translates into the, um, the production of dystrophin protein. So with this, we were able to see promising data that supports the every four week dosing that we intend to do in the clinic. But with a single dose, that's really valuable. However, we're going to be doing repeat administrations in the clinic. So we did another experiment in MDX mice. And on the next slide, we've got some of the data for that. So for our second study in the MDX mouse, we decided to look at not just the single dose side of things, but looking at what the levels for exon skipping and dystrophin look like after both one, two, three, and four doses. And the time points that we look after these are always four weeks post dose. And what's really important for this data is that we were able to see that after one dose, we've got about 55% exon skipping. However, with two, three, and four doses, we can continuously see increasing levels of exon skipping with repeat administration. And we even get up to very high levels of 91.5% exon skipping in the biceps after a single dose. However, again, one of the benefits that we can use with this MDX model is looking at the dystrophin protein levels as well. And again, when we look at it for a single dose, we've got just a little bit over 20% exon skipping four weeks post single dose. But we were able to look again after two, three, and four doses when we're dosing every four weeks and can see that with every additional administration that we give, we can see increasing levels of dystrophin. And after four doses, we could see very high levels of dystrophin in this nice model up to about 82.3%. So combined, both that single dose data and this repeat dose data has been very supportive to help us uh, progress our development um, further again and supporting what it could potentially look like in the clinic. But again, as I say, there's other compounds that are in development and we always wanna make sure that what we're developing has the potential to show superior activity. So we've done some comparison work looking at other PPMOs that are, are in development as well. And in our MDX mouse model with a single dose, we can see that we've got almost six times higher levels of exon skipping than other compounds. However, looking at mice is really valuable, but looking at NHP is even more important for us as well. So for in the NHP with our EDO51 compound, we have done a single dose study at 30 mg per kg. Now, there's different ways that you can read out exon skipping, and what we have here are two graphs using two very similar methods. One is by RT-PCR and one is by DD-PCR. Now, what we can see even by both methods, when we do a single administration in non-human primate and look at the exon skipping levels seven days post-dose, we can see that, again, we've got very high levels of exon skipping with our PGN-EDO51 compound, 
And we've got superior levels over an other compound that is also in development and using that as a comparison. So we can see that after a single dose of non-human primates, we can get high levels of just a little bit over 43% using the RT-PCR method, or just a little over 10% exon skipping when evaluated by DD-PCR. But importantly, we're continuously seeing between 8 and 13-fold higher levels of exon skipping. When we think about it, it's, you know, we've got the comparison of a single dose in the, in the MDX mouse and repeat dose in the MDX mouse. And we wanted to bring that forward as well into non-human primates. So with our single dose data in non-human primates, we looked at a 20 mg per cake dose for this one, and we evaluated by DDPCR. And the DDPCR method is a very similar one to what we read out for our exon skipping for the phase one data that Jane's going to share in a minute. But we can see that after a single dose in the non-human primate, we could get about two and a half percent exon skipping. However, with four doses, again, using the same paradigm of what we did in the MDX mouse of dosing every four weeks, we could see that we had 34.9% exon skipping in the biceps. So the benefit of having the single dose versus repeat dose comparison really allows us to show that with repeat administration, we're getting again, increasing levels of exon skipping that we believe that supports the potential for having a meaningful increase in exon skipping under this dosing regime. And again, that 14-fold increase in exon skipping with repeat administration is really supportive of how that could potentially look in the clinical side of things as well. So as I say, this is just a snapshot of some of our preclinical data. We've got a wealth of other data that supports the development of our compound as well, but at least this is a snapshot of some of the activity that we've been able to see that is showing promise for the development and the translation into the clinic as well. So just as a brief recap of some of the, the highlights that we've shown today, we've been able to see that in single dose, with a single dose in both wild type and MTX mice, our EDO technology can increase the delivery of exon skipping oligos. But importantly, we've got sustained high levels of both exon skipping and dystrophin four weeks post single dose. With our repeat dose for the MDX, as I showed already, we're able to see increasing levels in dystrophin with repeat doses and also for exon skipping. And again, this kind of paradigm that we're using of dosing every four weeks suggests the, the potential to support from the clinical side as well. Importantly, as I say, we've also looked at non-human primates after both a single and repeat dose. And we can see that our EDO51 consistently increases the potency of exon skipping for oligonucleotides but also that our data that we've generated so far supports the potential for meaningful increases in exon skipping when we dose every four weeks. So that's a, a snapshot of what we have at the moment, but we've got more powerful data from another clinical trial that we've done. So Jane, I'll hand it back over to you to go through that. Thank you, Ashling. You can imagine that when we had all of this animal data coming in, we were pretty excited about EDO51 and what it might be able to do. But Animals are animals. We can only do so much in animals. What we really want to know is what will EDO51 do in humans? Really what we want to know is what will EDO51 do in, in boys and young men with Duchenne? However, we didn't want to go directly into a, a clinical trial in boys and young men with Duchenne because we wanted to make sure by the time we, time we, can, we got to that point, we really knew our drug we really understood what dose to give. We wanted to be able to start at a dose that was potentially meaningful, where we'd see exon skipping in young men with Duchenne. We didn't want to have to start at a dose so low that there would be no positive effects for, for boys. So what we did was we, we did a phase one healthy volunteer study. So this was an a healthy adult males where we could ask some very generous volunteers to come in. There were 30, 32 men, eight per cohort who came in we gave them a single dose of EDO51 at ascending doses. And these lovely volunteers stayed in the clinic for 11 days while we measured everything we possibly could with respect to safety to really understand what our drug was doing. They also um, allowed us to take biceps biopsies on day 10 and day 28 so we could measure the effect of our, of our, our treatment. And this was an incredibly informative study and it's really gonna inform the Connect One study that we'll talk about in a moment. We learned a lot. They got a single intravenous administration of the drug. Obviously, when we go into boys and young men with Duchenne, it, um, it'll be multiple doses. As Ashling has already referred to, we're looking at monthly dosing. But in these healthy volunteers, we did a single dose. What did we learn? 
important things that we were really looking for is exon skipping. Can we actually see exon skipping in humans? The answer was yes. We saw the highest levels of exon 51 skipping that have ever been observed following a single dose in humans. The whole basis of our technology is based on the fact that we can get, the, uh, get oligonucleotide in better than anybody else. What did we see? We saw the highest levels of oligonucleotide delivery observed following a single dose in humans. And most importantly, the real point of the, of the study was to measure, to look at safety and tolerability, and EDO51 was generally well tolerated. Let me take you through some of the details. There's probably more details here than many of you care about, but in terms of safety, I think it's important just to talk about it because clinical trials are experimental drugs. We need to, we need to understand the safety. Most importantly in our phase one study, all participants completed the study. There were no discontinuations. There are always treatment emergent adverse events in a study, but most of the vast majority were mild. They resolved without any intervention. And importantly at 10 mg per keg, which was our second to highest dose, there were only grade one or mild AEs. And when you're thinking about what sort of adverse events we're talking about, we're talking about things like headaches or changes in blood chemistry, nothing that is particularly significant. We did at 15 mg per keg see one, what's considered a serious adverse event. Um, and in other participants, we, we saw similar event, um, events. This was well, at a lo lower level. These were changes in, in kidney biomarkers. These are things you measure in the blood. You don't really feel a change in kidney biomarkers, but they suggest potentially a change in kidney function. These were all very transient. They, they went up, they went down. They changed very quickly. They resolved in everyone. We had one person who had a, a more significant increase we, out of due caution, sent him to the hospital. That is why this was defined as a serious adverse event. And he received hydration. That is, he got an IV, IV of fluids and he came back to the phase one studying, as phase one unit and continued the study. We had two cases at the highest dose of mild to moderate hypomagnesemia. That's low magnesium in the blood. Again, there really were no clinical symptoms associated with this. And we didn't do anything about it. It came back to normal very quickly. But these are things we will keep an eye on as we go into the Connect on One study in boys and young men with Duchenne. I think even we were surprised by how effective our drug was when we um, started looking at the tissue concentrations. You can see here the placebo, we couldn't detect any tissue concentration, nor could we at one mg per kg. This was what we were trying to avoid doing in young men with Duchenne. Um, at 5 mg per keg, 10 mg per keg, and 15 mg per keg, we saw increasing amounts of our drug in the biceps tissue. And this was what we were hoping to see. And these levels are very high compared to other oligonucleotide drugs after a single, single dose. So we were very excited about this. But where the rubber really hits the road is could we see exon skipping? And the answer was yes. Where we could see tissue concentrations in the biceps, we also saw exon skipping in the biceps. It was dose dependent. And really importantly, we could see them see the exon skipping both at day 10 and day 28, which really gives us confidence that our monthly dosing regime that we were suggesting is appropriate. It also gives us confidence that if you have exon skipping at day 28 and you dose again, it's likely to accumulate, just as Ashling showed you in animal models, that really suggests we may be able to see accumulation of both skip transcript and dystrophin in people with DMD as we move forwards. So this was really exciting data to us. But going back to what we know from animals, we have this great data. EDO51 increases exon skipping. We see it in the tissue. We had some relatively minor safety signals. Going back to monkeys, we saw the same safety signals, these biomarkers, these changes in the blood in monkeys. This is at a high dose in, um, in a monkey after repeat dosing. And you can see, just as we saw in the humans on day two, the day after dosing, there was an increase in this molecule in the blood. It went away, just like it does in humans. But what intrigues us is in the animal models, we didn't see this after the second dose or after the third dose, and we've seen this multiple times. So we have reason to hope, based on our preclinical work, that the, that signal which we were looking at in the humans will not replicate after the second or third dose or, or be lower and certainly not get worse, which really supports that this will be tolerable with repeat dosing. Going back to potency, what we really care is can we, can we cause exon skipping? Can we produce the amount of dystrophin we think will be meaningful to young men with Duchenne? 
Going back to some of the data that Ashling showed you, on the left, we have the MDX mouse. That's that mouse model where we, where we looked at dystrophin and exon skipping. In the middle, we have the monkey. And in the right, we have the human. You can see in the mouse and in the monkey by RT-PCR, we saw similar amounts of exon skipping as we saw um, in both mouse and monkey. And in both cases, we were significantly higher than the competitor molecule. You can see then in, on the right central panel by DDPCR at 30 mg per keg, as Ashley said, we saw about 10% exon skipping. And then in the humans at 10 mg per keg, we saw about 1% exon skipping using that technique. What does that mean? It means our models are predictive. We expect to see what we saw in the animal models, which is accumulation with multiple doses. And we expect to be able to see meaningful amounts of exon skipping and dystrophin after repeat dosing. To show that here, you can see on the left in that, those healthy volunteers at day 10 and day 28 at 10 megs per keg, we saw one to one and a half percent exon skipping by DDPCR. In monkeys, and here we're showing 20 megs per keg, so twice the dose. When we started off after a single dose with 2.5 percent exon skipping, we saw a 14 fold increase after four doses, up to th nearly 35 percent exon skipping. This is what we're hoping to see, see in the boys and young men with Duchenne and really supports going into a multiple ascending dose study to determine how much dystrophin we can see in young men with Duchenne. And that I'm sure is what you're all interested in hearing more about. The next study, the study in Canada, the study, well, the phase one was also done in Canada, but this, the study in boys and young men with Duchenne. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Sarah, because this is what, as Michelle mentioned, we now have regulatory approval to go forwards with. Sarah, over to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Is everybody able to hear me? Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our phase two program for EDO 51. Um, as mentioned, we have two studies that are upcoming. One of them is our Connect One study and one of them is Connect Two. So Connect One um, will be our um, open label multiple ascending dose study in people with Duchenne, and that'll be done in Canada. And then Connect Two will be our randomized double blind placebo controlled multiple ascending dose study, and then that will be a global study. And for both of these studies, we're looking at both safety as well as dystrophin and exon skipping. So when we're looking to design a clinical trial, there are a few things that we try to keep in mind. Um, one of them is the purpose and the phase of the trial. So where are we in the phase of development, you know, phases one, two, three, or four? And for purpose, you know, are we looking primarily at safety? Are we looking primarily at efficacy? Or is there a combination? We're also wanting to make sure that we are defining our patient population. Um, as you know, a, a study is essentially a scientific ex experiment. So we want to define our patient population, and we do that through um, inclusion and exclusion criteria. We also want to make sure that we are um, we're looking at measuring the drug impact. Um, and for studies that are randomized and placebo controlled, that includes comparing the drug to placebo. Also, when we're designing the study, we want to make sure that we are selecting clinical trial endpoints that are meaningful. And so a lot of thought goes into how, how we design the study, including what procedures or assessments that you'll have done while you're in the study, and who is it that would qualify for the study. Jane, is there anything else that you would want to add? Yeah, just tying it back to you and the Duchenne community, um, we know that it's, it's very common that everyone wants to be involved in a trial, particularly a trial of a drug that seems as if it may be very effective. And people will always ask me is, well, why are you limiting this population? Why is it everybody can't be involved? And that really comes down to what Sarah was just saying is trying to understand what to measure and in who so we can see whether there's an effect as quickly as possible. Because really our goal and the community's goal as well is if the drug is effective, we want to know about it as soon as possible. We don't want to waste your time with a drug that doesn't work. We want to, but we want to be able to prove how effective the drug is and get it on the market and available to people around the world as, as fast as we can. So sometimes that does mean we have to use these inclusion and exclusion criteria to define a population where we can see a, a change in a specific endpoint more quickly and really use that information to then exp ex expand out to the rest of the population and get the drug to everyone more quickly. So ju that's just a question we get a lot and I wanted to emphasize that. 
So how do we get to where we go, where we are now? We have, we've obviously just been approved by the regulatory authorities to go ahead with um, the study, but all the way through our development process, we've been working with the community to try and make sure that our drug does something that's meaningful to you, that we uh, were, um, are measuring things that matter, and that we're develop, designing a trial that people want to be a part of, or at least can be a part of. We do recognize clinical trials are onerous. It's not easy to be a part of a trial, but we want to make it as easy as possible. So we work with the community really hand and fist all the way through our development to make sure that what we're doing is going to work for you as well. We have lots of different ways that we work with the community. And I'm going to talk about some of those as we move on to the next slides. I think one of the really important ways that we connect with our community is through going to meetings, talking to the community directly, spending time with the community, asking you what matters to you. So there are all kinds of community meetings around the world we take part in. We give talks, we hang out at booths. Over here, you can see Michelle and Elena at our booth at PPMD last year. We have posters and we talk to you and we get really concrete information back from you at those meetings. We also have a more formalized process called advisory committee meetings, where we talk directly with small groups and really get advice. We had three of these in 2023. We made sure we had people from Canada as well as people from the US and other communities where we're intending to hold trials. So we hear the differences and opinions and thoughts from different communities. And that's where we really dig into things like our trial design. What matters? What should we measure? What do we need to do in our trial to make it possible for you? And I'm going to hand it back to Sarah talk to you about some of the things we learned from these, these ad boards and community meetings and how we're implementing them in the Connects One study. Great. Thank you so much, Jane. So when we're talking to the advisory committees, um, we want to make sure that we're gathering as much feedback as we can to make this, to really make sure that our trials are not too burdensome. Um, personally, I know my, my husband has a congenital disability. He uses a manual wheelchair to get around. And I can't tell you how many times, you know, when we're going to travel somewhere, we may see that a hotel or someplace says that it's handicap accessible, but, and they may even have an elevator in the hotel, but to get to the elevator, you have to take a flight of stairs up or to get into the hotel, you have to go around the back alley through, you know, through like the dumpsters and back of the kitchen to get into the hotel. We want to make sure that from the time that our participants that are in this trial leave their house at the time that they come on site, that they really feel like they're being taken care of and that we truly make sure that everything is wheelchair friendly. Um, so that for me is very personal. And also when we're talking with the advisory committees, we really want to make sure that we're taking that feedback in into account. Um, similar to what we spoke about before with how we design a study, we want to make sure that we're finding that balance between capturing clinical trial endpoints that are really meaningful, but then not putting everything in the study that we could, that, like, we could possibly measure because we also don't want you to get the clinic for days on end doing different assessments. So for us, there really is that balance and we want to make sure that we are, we are taking care of the entire family throughout, throughout the process. Thanks, Sarah. And yeah, I cannot thank our advisors enough. The number of times we've asked them questions, they they give us give us um, feedback in these formal sessions, but we also email them and talk to them regularly and ask, what do you think of this? Or you suggest we need to do that, but we can't quite do that. Would this work instead? And these people have been with us all the way through. We will be asking more of them as we move through the programs, but as I hope it has really led us to design a study that people can take part in, recognizing it is an onerous process. Our lovely advisors also help us with other things. We have we, we try and communicate with the community, make sure people know what we're doing, where, when we're doing it, and what's going on. So we produce a number of materials that we share with the community. And we'll often get our advisors to take a look at them. Here on the slide, you can see a picture of our one pager that we, we share quite widely. Uh, Mallory, the young woman with Duchenne in the photo, was actually one of the people who reviewed this for us. And our advisors took a look at it and they said, we don't really like the order. What's important to us is not upfront and obvious. You need to change the order. So we did. I mean, this is not for me. This is not for Sarah. This is for the community. And we do this with a number of our materials. Very importantly, as, we, um, as we, we're coming forward towards the Connect One trial, we have a, a number of materials which will help people taking part in the trial know what's going on. And I'm going to ask Sarah to talk about those. Yeah, thank you, Jane. 
So I know it's in, you know, anytime we leave the house, right, it's really important for us to know what are we going to be walking into when you go into a site visit? Are you going to be there for two hours? Are you going to be there for 12 hours? Are there things that you should bring with you? What is it that you can expect when, when you go? So we, re we really want to make sure that the participants and their families have everything that they need so that they are confident that they know what they're walking into um, when they go for each site visit. So to that end, we've created a participant planner that walks them through that step. Um, really every every step of the way. And we also want to make sure, you know, when we're thinking about materials for our participants, there they're honestly can be a range of ages that, that, that they could possibly be. So we want to make sure we're also creating materials that are age appropriate. Um, and so and that's also where those other community materials come into place as well, because we want to make sure that you not only have your planner with all those details, but you also have um, you also have a workflow that you can look at to really understand the journey that you'll be taking as a participant. And then those, you know, as we look at the materials, those are the materials that you would be seeing if you were part of the study. But then even before then, in terms of our upcoming study, um, there are a few ways that you can find out about our studies. Um, obviously, there's the PEPGEN website. Um, there is clinicaltrials.gov. Um, I know that Defeat du Duchenne is a wealth of information, so you can definitely find out more about us there. And then we will be creating a study website as well, so we'll have, we'll have more details there. Thanks, Sarah. And we will share the details of the study website and such like with Defeat Duchenne and with the community as soon as it's available. But we're really looking forward to sharing more of those details about the trial. But I know one of the questions we always get is, how do I find out more? So we thought we'd put this into the slide and at least let you know that we, we um, do have plans to tell you more details soon. So we've talked a lot about the community and how, it's, how you inform us and we, infor we inform you. But we really believe that this is important to us as a company. So we, we don't want just Elena and I to know the Duchenne community. We want our entire company to. So periodically through the course of the year, we have members of the Duchenne community come and visit us, talk to everyone from our most junior admin person to the most to the CEO, who you can see talking to David there on the left. Um, everyone in our company has met people with Duchenne and heard from you directly what it's like to live with this disease. And I think this is really important to us to drive that urgency. We know how important this is to people and to make sure we all know who we're working for and what we're doing. And with that, I think we've spoken enough. I do want to thank you again. Thank you, the community, for all your support and all your help. Sp huge thanks to our advisors who have helped us along the way. And a, a big thank you to Defeat Duchenne for inviting us to speak today and everything else we do. This is just a collage of pictures from the walk to Defeat Duchenne last year. We will be doing it again this year. Our company's a bit bigger. We only had a few people last year, but we've got a lot bigger since then. And we're really excited to join, join you. That web, um, email address at the bottom, community at pepgen.com, that will, co will come to us. Please, at any point, if you have any questions, contact us there. When it comes to information about the trial, we'll probably direct you somewhere else because we can't talk to you directly about that. But any questions about what we've said today or what we're, um, we're doing, we're happy to answer. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see the questions. And I hope if you've got questions, um, please share them. And I'll invite my colleagues to come back on camera so we can um, answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Jane. I don't see any questions at the moment. I have a couple, but uh, most of all, thanks to uh, to you, Sarah, Ashley, Michelle. Um, what a great presentation this afternoon. And and I like where you were sort of ending on in the community because we hear all the time how great it is for the community um, here in Canada to be able to interact with uh, with yourself and others. And so thank you for making the time for that and, and for making the, the study and the work that goes involved with that, uh, making that as easy as possible for families. Um, credit to you. Um, one question, um, just in terms of sites, I don't think I heard it today, but maybe it was there and I missed it. Sites in Canada for the trial. Sarah, that one's probably for you. I think I'm off mute, right? Okay. Um, so we have not announced that yet, but you will be able to find details on clinicaltrials.gov. Okay. And of course, we have a clinical trial tracker um, for those of you joining us. Um, so you can find out the updates there as well. And that is on our website and it links through to clinicaltrials.gov. 
Um, you talked a little bit today about, um, you know, the other work that's coming along. Uh, obviously, this study is in 51. Um, and you also talked about the importance of, you know, while I may not have a child with uh, mutation 51, um, all of this research is helpful to the others. Can you just talk a little bit about that and, and why the research begins one, one place, but it actually will have benefits down, downstream as well? Great. I think I'm going to ask Michelle to address that. And then Ashling, if you want to talk a little bit about the other programs, that would be great. But Michelle, why don't you address the initial question? Yeah, so I think that what we learned from the EDO 51 program is certainly transferable to what we will be able to do for the other um, exon skipping um, molecules. So in 53, 44, and 45. And I think that um, just knowing um, and doing the clinical trials in this population, knowing from an operational standpoint, speaking to what Sarah was speaking to uh, previously, I think is something that'll be really helpful as we move on with these clinical trials, as we're very dedicated uh, to this community and to finding effective treatments uh, for people living with Duchenne. Um, Ashling, do you want to add? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. I think just to echo what Michelle has said as well, on the, the preclinical side of things, we're really pushing forward with getting uh, as advanced as we can with the technology, but also to support the additional exon skippers as well. So we're at different stages of development for our exon 53, our exon 45, and our exon 44 skipping programs as well. So um, hopefully we can be invited back next year and we can share more of the great data that we have coming through then as well. Absolutely. Come back anytime you have great updates. So um, I don't see any other questions. Is there anything else that oh, there, something has just popped in? Um, what is the plan for managing the hypomangi uh, kidney damage? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that question. The, qu the question was our plan for managing the hypomagnesemia and kidney damage. And I will say it is not really kidney damage, but I'll um, let Michelle answer in a more fulsome manner. Yeah, so um, what we had seen in uh, prior studies is, is that there were some changes, as Jean had uh, re referred to previously when she was discussing the results from the phase one study, some transient, monitorable, and reversible changes in kidney biomarkers. And for the majority of those changes that we had seen, there was no intervention needed. Um, really, it was just monitoring to make sure um, that the biomarkers go back to their baseline or within normal levels. And this usually happened within 24 to 48 hours. And um, it's really nice to see that the non-clinical models reflect also what we are seeing in the clinical models. So we have confidence um, in what we're also seeing in the healthy volunteers. And this will also um, be monitored uh, in the clinical studies. So um, if you enroll in one of our clinical studies, we will be monitoring your kidney function as well as looking at electrolytes such as magnesium. Should they be low, um, there are uh, treatments uh, for it, but we have not needed to treat uh, thus far um, except for the one um, patient, I'm sorry, one healthy volunteer at the very high dose, um, which we will likely not go that high, um, which is one of the learnings from our healthy volunteer uh, study. Um, but again, um, at doses that we know are uh, potentially clinically relevant and efficacious, um, we will be monitoring these levels and then if needed, we'll treat appropriately. Okay, a second question. Um, the mouse study used in EDO23, is that rel uh, relative to humans with deletion or I guess exon 23? Ashling, that is probably one for you as the mice are yours. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Happy to take this one. So that's a really great point. So our EDO23 compound is actually an analog or a surrogate that we use for exon 51 so that we can get exon skipping in mice. So in the MDX mouse, they have a mutation in exon 23. So we're able to skip that and restore the reading frame. However, the sequence that we have in, in humans, that sequence isn't quite conserved in, in any mouse model. It is conserved in NHP. And in NHP, we can use the EDO51 model or molecule that we have. Um, but as I say, it's uh, the, the translatability using EDO23 and using the mouse models has been shown to translate really well, both into non-human prim uh, non primates and also as Michelle and Jane have shown, also translating into healthy volunteers as well. So we're, we're optimistic with the, the translatability across the species, but with our 23 surrogate compound, but also with our actual EDO51 compound as well. Uh, just to be clear, that EDO23 is targeted to, a, to the mouse um, dystrophin gene. It would not work in a human directly. Okay. Another question, um, what are the doses for the MAD studies? I believe that was in the press release this morning. Michelle, do you want to address that? 
Yes. Yeah, so um, in uh, in health uh, in Canada, we will be starting at five mg per kg, um, which is a dose uh, that has been shown to be well tolerated. Um, we did not actually in the healthy volunteer study see any treatment emergent adverse events at that dose. And um, but also, as Jane had said, is that what we did see is we did see some potential efficacy at that dose with exon skipping. So um, it's a safe and tolerable dose that may uh, provide uh, some efficacy to people who enroll in that cohort. Then we are planning to increase the doses uh, to 10 mg per kg and then potentially to a higher dose after the 10 mg per kg dose. Um, all of these escalations in doses are dependent on review by a data safety monitoring board. And for those of you that are not familiar, a data safety monitoring board is an external group of people um, that uh, evaluate our safety data and provide information or uh, provide um, uh, uh, recommendations uh, for dose escalation. So when they are not part of PEPGEN, they're an independent group, and we provide them with this data. Jane, do you want to um, add to that? No, I think you've, you've covered it, that we will only escalate as, as far as is safe. We will not be escalating too far. Regardless, we have we have caps where we won't go above. So I think you've cover, covered that very well. Back to Exxon 23, um, an individual is asking, where in the development queue is uh, Exxon 23 skipping? We have... I'll, I'll let Ashley, Ashley answer this as well, but effectively we've done no work yet, but Ashley. Yeah, so exon 23 is just the surrogate molecule that we use for the mouse work. So we wouldn't actually be doing exon 23 um, in, 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 in DMD individuals. Or not, not, not at this time point anyway, potentially in the future, if there were uh, the, the right people available and such like is not one we've looked at yet. Okay, well, Jane, um, Ashling, Michelle, and Sarah, there are no further questions. Really want to thank you for your time today. This is an important update for the Canadian community and, and one we're proud to partner with you on. And uh, thank you for being involved in our educational partnership program this year. We'll see you later, the, at, later in the year with updates and, and certainly at the Family Forum in Ottawa. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Bye. Take care. And uh, before we go, we'll uh, talk about a couple of things that are happening uh, across the organization. Um, before we leave, the next in our industry partner updates is with Dying Therapeutics. That is on Wednesday, May the 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, you can register for that off our website or see it in some of the emails that you see going out to the community. A big day for us at Defeat Duchenne Canada is a week this coming Sunday. It is our annual Walk to Defeat Duchenne. As Jane mentioned, um, the PepGen team will be involved and we want you to join us across the country as well, walking in your community. We have more registrants this year than last year. And uh, last year, we raised over $200,000. So that is a week Sunday, the Walk to Defeat Duchenne. Our monthly community social is Wednesday, May 31st. That's at 7 p.m. in the evening. It's called Canadians Talk Duchenne, and it's a social for parents, caregivers, and those living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This month, we'll hear the struggles and the triumphs of a BC family. That's Anne and Riley from BC. Our community annual general meeting is coming up on Monday, June the 5th. You can register to join us in person or virtually. Uh, we have guests joining us across the country. That will be at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time uh, for Monday, June the 5th. And if you've not connected with us for emergency care resources, please do so. These are free and available to you. They were developed last year and sent to many members of the Duchenne community across the country. Um, just reach out to us online or give us a call here in the office and we'll be more than happy to send those out to your home and uh, to multiple family members as well. And a reminder, we talked a little bit about this uh, in the presentation with Jane and the team. Um, we do have a clinical trial finder tool on our website. This is a guide for all trials that are happening with details that you would want to know, including where those are once they have been determined. Um, so you can check that out on our website at defeatduchenne.ca backslash uh, clinical trial clinical trial finder tool. Um, and a reminder to stay in touch with us through our social media channels and don't forget to subscribe to our e-newsletter uh, for all the latest updates. And with that, I will close it out today by thanking you, thanking the PepGen team. Uh, and our next webinar is on Wednesday, uh, May 31st. That is with um, another uh, biofirm uh, that will talk to us at that time. That's, that's Wednesday, May 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks very much for joining us here today, and we'll see you next time.